Thank you, Vitek. Uh, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for having invited me to this beautiful program. Even if I, I cannot say I am following too many lectures so well. <coughs> uh, on the other hand, I hope this lecture uh, certainly can be followed by most of you. Uh, uh, I should say that uh, I think the whole program has been uh, uh, charted by the organizers and they suggested that I should speak on the derived aspects, but I hardly know anything about uh, derived aspects, so I will speak what uh, I can. <coughs> All right, so uh, I begin uh, by defining uh, what the branching laws are. Uh, perhaps this has not been uh, explicitly mentioned in this program. If you have a subgroup of a group and you have a representation of the bigger group, uh, one is often interested in decomposing the representation of the bigger group restricted to the smaller group and these are what are called branching laws. And many problems in representation theory can be interpreted as a branching law of one kind or the other. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, basic examples and of interest to many of us is uh, this uh, branching law called Klipsch Gordon theorem, which uh, tells the tensor product of two irreducible representations of SL2C and it has this form. Uh, so in this lecture, we will be dealing mostly with uh, infinite dimensional uh, representations of a group G, which when restricted to H are usually not completely reducible. And there is often no obvious meaning to decomposing the representation restricted to H or a meaning has to be assigned in some precise way, such as the planchural decomposition for unitary representations of G restricted to H. So actually in this lecture, unless otherwise mentioned, we will say that a representation pi2 of H appears in a representation pi1 of G if this home space is non-zero. So this is, uh, now, what means the branching law to understand uh, all the representations pi2 of H which appear in pi1 and they appear in this sense and then this home space also is a certain vector space and then its uh, dimension will be called the multiplicity. Okay, so the local GGP conjectures which are all theorems now considers such branching laws for certain pair of classical groups uh, G comma H which in this lecture we will often take to be one of these two pairs GLN plus 1 comma GLN or SON plus 1 comma SON where F is a local field and uh, although much of what I say eventually may hold good for Archimedean but that usually needs separate consideration so in this lecture, it will exclusively be non-Archimedean. So for an irreducible, sorry, I went too far. For an irreducible admissible representation pi1 of SON plus 1, this is the bigger group, and pi2 of SONF, the question of interest for GGP is the understanding of the home spaces, harm pi1, pi2. So pi1 is the representation on the bigger group, pi2 on the smaller group, and you are looking at when pi2 appears in pi1 as a quotient, and this home oh. space can be rewritten in this, and then it can be rewritten in this form as uh, it appeared in uh, uh, lectures of, for example, uh, Raphael. So X is this uh, spherical variety SON, SONF cross SON plus 1. So in fact, uh, I was also suggested that uh, I should uh, try to uh, uh, 
tailor my lectures using a, a spherical variety like SX and uh, uh, think of representations pi 1 check tends of pi 2 as representation of the ambient larger group of which this is the spherical variety. But for certain purposes to have two groups is convenient and uh, 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 I think uh, to have this product structure is, uh, uh, is an advantage in some situations because indeed the two groups uh, do play some role. Okay. Okay, so the first important result proved is the multiplicity one property uh, that this uh, home space is at most one dimensional. It looks like a very classical uh, result, but uh, I know it was sought after for uh, many years before it became a theorem. Uh, so only about a decade back. Uh, so I should also add that uh, before the full multiplicity one theorem was proved, even finite dimensionality of the multiplicity, multiplicity spaces was not known, which were later answered in greater generality in this book of uh, Sacralides Venkates, which, uh, uh, which I think has been also mentioned in several lectures. For infinite dimensional representations, which is what we are mostly dealing with, there is also the possibility that these multiplicity spaces could be identically zero. There is no guarantee that, uh, you know, given pi 1, there is some pi 2 which is a quotient. So it needs some argument. With the multiplicity 1 theorems proved, one then goes on to prove a more precise description of the set of irreducible admissible representations pi 1 of SON plus 1 and pi 2 of SON for which the home space is non-zero. So these are the, uh, this is the complete branching law that uh, the GGP conjectures uh, consider and uh, that has been uh, exposed in some ways in some, some lectures here. Uh, so, okay, so these, uh, these have become available in a series of papers due to Walsh-Perger, moglin perger for orthogonal groups and by Buja plasi for unitary groups. And I give some of the many uh, papers which have been written on this topic. Given the interest in the spaces, home spaces, uh, it is natural to consider the related X spaces. Uh, and in fact, homological algebra methods suggest that the simplest answers are not for these individual spaces, but for the alternating sum of their dimensions, uh, which is uh, what is called the Euler Poincare pairing of pi 1 and pi 2, which is uh, um, alternating sum of the dimensions of the X groups. Uh, these hopefully more manageable objects, certainly more flexible when coupled with vanishing of higher x when available may give theorems about home spaces. Now we hasten to add that before we can define the Euler Poincare, x i needs to be proven to be finite dimensional for pi 1 and pi 2, let's say finite length admissible representation of the associated groups and also proved to be zero for large i. Uh, the vanishing of the x for large i is a well-known generality. Uh, for reductive PRD groups considered here, it is known that x ties are zero for any two smooth representations pi, pi prime of g whenever i is greater than the, uh, greater than the f split rank of the group. Uh, this is a standard application of the projective resolution of the trivial representation of G provided by the Bruha Tits building associated to G. So, because the building is contractible, this gives, uh, this gives rise to a resolution of the trivial representation by uh, compact induction, which are projective modules. So, and then if you have any other representation, you tensor that exact sequence by pi and that gives you a resolution of pi and then one has to just observe that pi tensor induction k to g is also projective module. 
so uh, yeah so that was uh, vanishing outside uh, uh, the rank of the group so for instance for pgl2 uh, x i is as 0 for i greater than or equal to 2 uh, for pgl2 or for sl2 beyond 1 it is all 0 for the proof of the finite dimensionality of x i we note that unlike home spaces where we will have no idea how to prove finite dimensionality if both pi 1 and pi 2 are cuspidal for x i exactly this case can be handled a priori for i positive as almost by the very definition of a cuspidal representation they are both projective and injective objects in the category of a smooth representations. So, somehow cuspidals create no problems and the finite dimensionality of x i when one of the representation is a full principal series is achieved by an inductive argument both on n and on the split rank of the levy from which the principal series arises. The resulting analysis needs the notion of Bessel models which uh, will come up in this lecture but uh, uh, that may need some uh, uh, more attention so I think those slides I may fast forward but uh, um, in any case uh, the point being made is that uh, um, uh, in the analysis of uh, harm spaces or X spaces the orbit methods uh, lead you on to some other smaller groups and these are called the Bessel subgroups and uh, one can make an inductive argument. Recent, however, recently there is a very general finiteness theorem for x i for uh, spherical varieties due to Eisenberg and Sayag. So, this is a paper uh, quite recent. Um, however, the approach via Bessel models which intervened when analyzing the principal series representations of SO n plus 1 uh, has as a bonus explicit answers about Euler Poincare. So, which we will have occasions to say something about. Okay, so the work of Eigen but Sayag also has uh, this definition. Uh, I am sure this is a, a well known definition, but certainly it is good to have it. So, this is the notion of a locally finite representation. So, if, uh, if G is a periodic group, pi a smooth representation of G, then pi is said to be locally finite representation of G if it satisfies one of the following equivalent conditions. For each compact open subgroup K of G, the space of K fixed vectors which is a module for the Hecke algebra should be finitely generated. Or uh, for each cuspidal datum M comma rho where m is a Levy subgroup and rho is a cuspidal representation of m, uh, pi m rho which is the corresponding component of pi in the Bernstein decomposition of representations of g is a finitely generated g module. So, these two definitions are equivalent and they define locally finite representations. Okay. Mm, uh, so, the theorem of Sayag is the following, uh, uh, for pi an irreducible representation of gln plus 1, the restriction of pi to gln f is locally finite. And as I said, uh, you know I am using uh, sometimes these explicit groups, but these are true for any of the GGP pairs. Uh, So, yeah, so in fact, uh, uh, somehow the theorem of Eisenberg Sayag uh, assumes that uh, one already knows uh, finite multiplicity is known and uh, the, somehow they build on the finite uh, known multiplicity, and which is the work, as I said, of Sakularidis and Venkatesh. So, for us the relevance of that uh, locally finite representation is that uh, it proves the finite dimensionality of the X groups. So, the following corollary is the following corollary is an easy consequence of the standard homological algebra 
where we also use the fact that if a module is finitely generated over a Noetherian ring, then it has a resolution by finitely generated projective modules. So, uh, you know, when I made that argument about tensoring with pi, the objects were quite large. So, uh, that argument needs to be replaced by a projective resolution which is finitely generated. But uh, replacing that by a finitely generated projective resolution is a generality. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the corollary is that uh, Mm, uh, uh, if pi 2, pi 1 and pi 2 are roots representations of uh, the gln plus 1 and gln, then the x spaces are finite dimensional and 0 beyond this split rank of h. So, I think uh, uh, this theorem and theorems of this kind seem to have a good uh, uh, conceptual framework and they work in a good generality. Okay, so uh, I want to begin with uh, somehow the simplest of all branching laws, which is indeed uh, at the basis of uh, GGP, that uh, there is uh, the following theorem uh, given an irreducible generic representation of GLN plus 1 and of GLN each such generic pi 2 appears in each such generic pi 1 and the multiplicity space is at most one dimensional. So, that is a generality at most one dimensional as I said it is a theorem and uh, it is equal to 1 is part of the rankin selberg I am not sure uh, whether uh, uh, less than equal to 1 can be proved mm, in this case more directly. So, in any case there is this theorem. So, uh, what I am going to do next is to look at the Euler-Poincare version of this theorem and uh, the following theorem can be considered as the Euler-Poincare version of the above theorem and is much more flexible than the previous theorem and uh, the point I am trying to make is it is also proved much more easily. Uh, so, the theorem is that if pi 1 is an admissible representation of gln plus 1 of finite length and pi 2 of uh, gln f of finite length, then these x spaces are finite dimensional that we already knew, but in this case anyway that can also be proved directly. And the point is that the Euler-Poincare here is the product of the dimension of their Whittaker spaces. So, wh pi 1 and wh pi 2 denotes the space of Whittaker models of pi 1 uh, with respect to a fixed non-degenerate character on the maximal unipotent group. So, you know I note this follow, following corollary of this theorem that if pi 1 and pi 2 are irreducible representation then the Euler-Poincare just like the Hom space takes only two values 0 and 1. And in particular, it is always bigger than or equal to 1. So, uh, I, I do not know other contexts in Euler, uh, where Euler-Poincare is always positive unless of course, Euler-Poincare is contributed only from H0, but in the generality that we are dealing with at the moment, Euler-Poincare is not contributed only from H0. So, it is a bit curious that Euler-Poincare takes only these two values and uh, it is greater than equal to 0. Whittaker of pi means the home space, right? So, the dimension of the space of Whittaker functionals, right? Yeah. You do not need to be injective or anything. No, the, the, the usual space of Whittaker models on pi 1. So, if pi 1 has just in the growth entity group, it is summation n i pi i, then it is the sum of the dimension of the Whittaker model for pi i. Yeah, but by Whittaker model, you do not mean that pi injects into the Whittaker? No, I mean just the space of linear forms which are psi equivalent. 
you know, I, I, what I am saying is that, uh, you know, most of the theorems in the subject, they deal with irrutable objects and it is important only to deal with irrutable objects. But euler poincare is somehow, it is made to deal with uh, finite length objects without any extra effort. So somehow the content of this theorem uh, is no more than the content of this theorem just for irrutable representations. By very de definition, euler poincare is additive on uh, Grothendi group and so is the right hand side. Okay, so uh, I just uh, want to quickly give you a proof of this theorem to maybe convince you that it is indeed quite elementary. The proof of this theorem is accomplished using some results of Bernstein Jelwinski regarding the structure of representations of GLN plus 1 restricted to the metabolic. Uh, recall that EN, the metabolic subgroup, consists of matrices whose last row is uh, 0, 0, 001. And for a representation pi of GLN plus 1, Bernstein Jelminski defined the ith derivative of pi, which is a representation of GLN plus 1. Pi i is the ith derivative of pi and which is a representation of n plus 1 minus i. Of crucial importance is the fact that if pi is of finite length, then these derivatives are also representations of finite length. Okay, so Bernstein Jelinski proved that the restriction of an admissible representation to the metabolic uh, subgroup En has a finite filtration whose successive quotients are described by the derivative. This is one of their uh, basic uh, results. Uh, uh, so using the bernstein jelminski filtration as it is called and a form of Frobenius reciprocity for X groups, the theorem eventually follows from the following EG lemma. So uh, this is the EG lemma that if V and W are finite length representations of the same group GLD, then the euler poincare is 0. And uh, you know, in some sense, uh, one argument to make a proof of this is that uh, euler poincare does not vary in families and you can multiply a representation by mod x to the power uh, uh, some uh, constant and change the central characters and then the euler poincare will become 0. And of course, if d is 0, then the euler poincare is dimension v times dimension w. So this is a d equals 0. So gl0 is the trivial group. And then the euler poincare is the product of the dimension, which is what is responsible for the theorem. OK. So one of the ways this theorem on euler poincare can be used is also to say that there are some non-trivial x which are there. And uh, so uh, uh, one knows that they are irreducible generic representations of GL3, which have the trivial representation of GL2 as a quotient. Similarly, they are irreducible non-generic representations of GL3, which have irreducible generic representations of GL2 as a quotient. For such pairs, uh, it follows from our theorem on euler poincare that euler poincare of pi1 comma pi2 is zero because one of the spaces is non-generic, product of the uh, space of uh, Wittager models. So in this case, euler poincare is zero. On the other hand, by the very construction, the home space is non-zero. And therefore, uh, some x must be non-zero. Okay. Uh, So the following conjecture made by the speaker several years ago seems to be at the root of why the simple and general result of the previous section on euler poincare translates into a simple result about home spaces for generic representations. So you know, I think it would be the usual wishful thinking that uh, if you have a irreducible generic representation of GLN plus 1 and pi 2 of GLN, then the euler poincare is one and home space is also one dimensional and uh, uh, you know this is the most uh, obvious thing you may uh, expect that uh, it is so because all the higher x are zero so uh, i suggested this a uh, few years ago and uh, this has recently been proved by chan and savin uh, in in this particular case yeah okay so, 
you know, uh, the non-vanishing of the X groups in certain cases and vanishing in most other cases implies that the restriction to GLN F of a smooth representation is almost projective. Uh, the following theorem of Chan gives a complete classification of irreversible representations of GLN plus 1, which when restricted to GLN F are projective modules. So, uh, here is the theorem, let pi be an irreversible representation of GLN plus 1, then pi restricted to GLN F is projective representation if and only if either pi is essentially discrete series or uh, this n plus 1 is twice an integer and pi is pi 1 cross pi 2. So, there is a nice and complete classification. Uh, in this remark, I am asking that uh, this theorem of Chan should in fact be asking not for when pi 1 restricted to GLNF is projective, but rather in a particular Bernstein component when it is projective. So, that would be a more precise question and uh, 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 there is some way to respond to that. I, I may come back to that. Uh, okay, so uh, in this slide, uh, Okay, so far we have been discussing the question of which representations of GLN F appear as a quotient for an irreducible representation of GLN plus 1. It is possible to have a more complete understanding of a what a representation of GLN plus 1 F restricted to GLN F actually looks like. So, you know, having a quotient module, uh, I think, uh, does not give you uh, a complete information about. Uh, how it may appear uh, as a sub module or sub quotients and what is the uh, uh, structure in which it is buried. So, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I feel that this question has uh, a nice answer and uh, my purpose in next few slides is to show some simple cases in which one can indeed give a nice answer. So, uh, I already alluded to what is called the Bernstein decomposition. Uh, so, recall according to Bernstein, the category of smooth representations can be decomposed into Bernstein blocks indexed by pairs m, comma, rho, where m is a Levy subgroup, rho is cuspidal representation, and the pair m, comma, rho taken up to G conjugacy and up to what is called inertial equivalence. Now, one can ask to decompose a representation of GLN plus 1 when restricted to GLNF in terms of the Bernstein decomposition of the representations of GLNF. So, this uh, notation is for the category of smooth representations of GLNF. So, we discuss this in one simple case next. Okay, so uh, that discussion is based on a theorem of Alan Roche. Uh, I mean, uh, it may appear to be an elementary theorem, but I think it, there is some subtlety here. Okay, so this theorem says that uh, let G be a reductive PRD group, uh, uh, M comma rho a cuspidal datum, let M not be the subgroup of M generated by compact elements in M, assume that no non-trivial element in the wild group uh, uh, normalizer of M in G upon M preserves rho up to an unramified twist. So, no non-trivial element fixes rho. Then the theorem is that the induced representation is irreducible and furthermore, the parabolic induction from P to G gives an equivalence of categories R m rho to R g m rho. So, this is an equivalence of categories. In particular, since the category of representation R m rho is the same as the category of modules over the ring of functions on the complex torus consisting of the unramified twists of rho. The same is true of the Bernstein component R G M rho. So, this, uh, this uh, kind of Bernstein component of G one may call the simplest in which uh, uh, there is no ramification. Uh, 
I think one could call this uh, uh, without ramification for which no non-trivial element in the normalizer of M preserves rho up to an unramified twist. So for, uh, uh, for this Bernstein block, uh, the category is the category of uh, functions on the complex torus consisting of the unramified twists of rho. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, here is the proposition. So let pi1 be an, uh, be an irreversible generic representation of gln plus 1 and you give yourself a cuspidal datum for gln f for which we assume that no non-trivial element preserves rho up to an unramified twist. Let rho naught be an irreversible representation of rho restricted to m naught the subgroup M generated by compact elements, then the M rho Bernstein component of pi 1 restricted to GLN F is the universal principal series representation, this one. In particular, the Bernstein, uh, this particular Bernstein component of pi 1 is independent of pi 1. So, the content of this proposition is saying that uh, the restriction problem from GLN plus 1 to GLN has uh, this nice answer for certain Bernstein blocks. Okay. So, in fact, I give a quick proof of this. By the above theorem of Ross, we are reduced to observing the following lemma where we appeal to the theorem of Eisenberg Sayak for finite generation and the multiplicity one theorem for generic representations. And uh, here is the lemma, let R be a reduced Noetherian commutative ring, M a finitely generated module over R such that for each maximal ideal M of R, M mod MM is free of rank 1 over R mod M, then M is free of rank 1 Well, I think I should have said M is projective of rank 1 over R, but I think the rings that we are applying to are ring of functions on the tori for which uh, uh, I guess there is no difference between projective and being free. Okay. All right. Okay, so I want to make some remarks on this. Uh, the above simple minded description of the restriction problem is not valid for other blocks such as the Iwahori block, which seems like a very interesting question. Notice that the universal principal series for the Iwahori block is induction from B0 to G of the trivial representation, which generically has multiplicity equal to the order of the Weyl group. So, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, universal principal series has uh, a large multiplicity uh, because uh, if uh, chi 1 chi n uh, principal series appears, then all the W conjugate of it also appears. So, therefore, it is not the right candidate for us as we are in a multiplicity 1 situation. So, somehow out of this, we need to pick out a uh, a multiplicity one uh, part of it and this one is not multiplicity one part. So uh, actually by a theorem of Chan and Savin for G any split group, the Iwahori component of the Gelfand graph representation can be described from GOF to GF of the Steinberg and therefore for pi1 a supercuspidal representation of gln plus 1 the uahori component of pi1 restricted to glnf is given by this so uh, for supercuspidal representation the uahori block uh, of pi1 restricted to gln is this because uh, pi1 restricted to glnf is in that uh, case the, just the gelfand graph and uh, uh, for the Gelfand graph, graph, the Iwahori block has been determined. It is natural to suggest uh, using the non-tempered GGP, which uh, allows some non-trivial branchings to be anticipated. 
and uh, something which has also been proved by Chan and Max Gurevich that this is the case for any so uh, uh, this is a suggestion that I am making uh, that any temporary representation pi 1 as long as its cuspidal support does not contain an unramified character the restriction to the Iwahori block is this one. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, you know, so far I was uh, concentrating on GLN and now I want to uh, quickly say a few things uh, about uh, classical groups. So in the next few sections, uh, we discuss euler poincare characteristic for branching large for classical groups, restricting ourselves to this particular situation, SON plus 1 containing SON. Uh, so, you know, I do not think we are going to use uh, Bessel models in much ways, uh, uh, except to recall that these are defined whenever we have quadratic spaces, uh, uh, V by W and odd dimensional split quadratic. But I think uh, it is not essential. In some sense, uh, if uh, co-dimension of W in V is 1, then it is just the branching problem from SON plus 1 to SON. Uh, okay. So the following proposition calculates Euler-Poincare in some cases for classical groups. I have not yet found a result which is as simple as the corresponding result for GLN. Although there must certainly be one. Uh, so the, uh, the proposition here is that let pi be a finite length representation of SOV, pi prime of SOV prime which is uh, one, one less variable than SOV. And if pi is a representation of SOV, so you know this is a notation used for classical groups in which this component is for general linear group and this component is for classical groups of the same kind but in a smaller number of variable and here uh, one is uh, looking at a case when uh, uh, the uh, part in the classical group is almost not there. So uh, we are not uh, uh, dealing with a general representation of SOV but only those for which uh, the parabolic induction does not deal with, uh, uh, with the uh, SOW. So in this case, the Euler-Poincare for pi pi prime is again the same. So there is no restriction on pi prime, but, uh, but for pi there is a restriction. So unlike the theorem for GLN plus 1 to GLN, where both pi and pi prime were pretty arbitrary and one had this uh, result. For this one, uh, uh, it, it is uh, assuming that somehow uh, the part of pi uh, uh, does not have much of classical groups in it. People who uh, know the GGP recipe will recognize that it is a case in which uh, the branching problem happens on the uh, on the generic component of SOV and of SOV prime. So this is a situation in which uh, the recipe says that the branching happens only for the generic uh, pi and generic pi prime. So you know, I am using that notation. I think it is from the Tardich school that you know uh, they write some GLN NI and then they write the classical group and they write the semi direct product and here I am looking at a representation of SOV. So this is a representation of a smaller orthogonal group and I am saying that this smaller orthogonal group is either not there if dimension W is 0 or it is dimension W equals 1 again it is not there. So uh, the this is parabolic induction, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, this is, uh, I am not assuming irritability of any kind. Uh, 
Na, and uh, yeah. You're not assuming irreversibility. Uh, yeah, no, no irreversibility of any kind. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is with the correct choice. So you know, I think it is also part of the GGP that uh, somehow if you are given V prime in V, then it uh, fixes the uh, Whittaker datum. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, so there is uh, some result on Euler Poincaré. Uh, and I, I want to uh, uh, discuss in some other situations where euler poincares have a region and then I want to go on to was uh, integral formula. So the th uh, following theorem was conjectured by Kazdan and was proved by Schneider Stuhler and also by Roman Bajrukov Nikov. It is known only in characteristic 0 and uh, this is uh, what is called uh, uh, yeah, there is some name, uh, some orthogonality relation. Mm. So in any case, uh, the theorem is that if pi and pi prime are finite length, smooth representation of a reductive PRD groups, then the Euler Poincare of pi pi prime is given by uh, the uh, character theta c theta prime bar c dc on the set of regular elliptic elements and uh, which comes together with a natural Haar measure which is given by uh, this order of the Weyl group, uh, the Weyl denominator and uh, d gamma where d gamma is the normalized Haar measure on the elliptic torus T which is the centralizer of gamma. So, there is the integral formula which expresses uh, Euler Poincare in terms of the characters. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, suppose, I mean, we are usually in the distinguished uh, problem and I take the pipe um, to be the trivial, then uh, do, do, like, do we have some condition of pi to guarantee that like, the, all the higher extension vanishes except for the Zero. So we really get the I think one knows that the higher x even for trivial, you know, x d of Steinberg comma one is non-trivial. Of Steinberg. Yeah. Okay. Universal. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, in this slide I make some comments about the calculation on x i. Uh, this has been carried out in uh, several cases. Uh, in particular, if both pi 1 and pi 2 are tempered representation, this is done using the theory of R groups in this uh, quite uh, non-trivial work of Obdan and Solowell. Uh, so I think there is a rather complete information about x i. Uh, on the other hand, x i for certain non-tempered representations are considered in this article of Jean-Francois Dat on symmetric spaces and Orlik. Uh, uh, so these are components of the uh, principal series which contains the trivial representation. These are certain sub quotients of that principal series which uh, has the trivial representation. In the Archimedean case, much uh, has been studied on GK cohomology, which is uh, subject of x i c comma pi, but uh, as far as I know, not on these objects. Okay. Uh, so next, I uh, you know my purpose is to not uh, give you a very uh, technical and accurate exposition on this uh, Walsh-Perger integral formula which I think of this as uh, something like Kazdan orthogonality. That is the point I wanted to make. Uh, there is a bit of notation which goes with it. Uh, since we do not have time because it uses some Bessel models, etc. Uh, 
certain elliptic tori of so in the Kazan's uh, orthogonality uh, elliptic tori uh, general elliptic tori but uh, in the theorem of walls per j uh, one needs to be specific about what elliptic tori one needs to use they are not maximal tori but they are elliptic tori of a certain kind uh, so i have written but i don't think i have so much time left so I just want to come to the theorem, uh, the integral formula of Walsh-Perger. I think uh, Walsh-Perger wrote two papers, uh, one about 120 pages and another about 150 pages, in which he, the main aim of the paper was to prove this theorem. And uh, uh, this he did for orthogonal group. And I'm sure it was one of the important things that Raphael had to deal with. So, so for any irreducible admissible representation sigma of SOV and sigma prime of SOW, one defines this C sigma sigma prime uh, order, uh, order of the wild group and these are certain functions on the torus defined uh, via the character theory of sigma and sigma prime. So just like the Kazdan orthogonality had the characters, this one also has the, uh, rather the, these are related by the germ of the character expansion on the centralizer of these elliptic tori. Uh, I have uh, reviewed that in the previous slides, but as I said, I will not. I think it suffices to say that these are certain functions on elliptic uh, tori. So, uh, one of the things that walsh proves is that this is a finite sum of absolutely convergent integrals. So, uh, independent of uh, whether these representations are supercuspidal or tempered, for any uh, uh, admissible representation, this is a finite sum of absolutely convergent integrals. And then he proves these two theorems. If either sigma is supercuspidal and sigma prime is arbitrary, or both sigma and sigma prime are tempered, then this C sigma prime, C sigma sigma prime, defined by this integral, is the dimension of the Hom spaces. So he proved this in the two in the two papers. Uh, the first paper is about this case. If sigma is supercuspidal, and the second paper is this case. Uh, he proved that this is equal to this. So somehow uh, uh, these are the methods of the local trace formula, which also are uh, what goes into that elliptic uh, orthogonality. Uh, okay. So given the theorem of Walsh-Perger, it is most natural to propose the following conjecture on Euler Poincaré pairing, following the uh, same notation that uh, the Walsh-Perger integral formula proved in some cases, in fact, is a integral formula for the Euler-Poincaré for arbit arbitrary representations of finite length. So uh, uh, this would be very much like Kazan orthogonality and uh, mm, I mean to me uh, it does not seem obvious how one could uh, go from uh, whatever has been proven to prove this, but uh, uh, this looks reasonable to me and uh, uh, together with the fact that uh, if one has irreducible tempered representations, then uh, it is being proposed that the Euler-Poincaré is, is given by the same integral formula which was for J has proved for the Hom spaces and in these cases the extra spaces are zero. Okay, so uh, I, I just want to uh, show you one case. Walsh-Perger's uh, theorem is equivalent to the conjectural statement on the Euler-Poincaré. If sigma or sigma prime is supercuspidal, except that it is not proven if sigma prime is supercuspidal, but sigma is arbitrary, because in that case, uh, Hom and X are the same, uh, and, uh, Hom space and Euler-Poincaré are the same because one of the representation being supercuspidal means the higher X are 0. So uh, 
uh, one needs to prove Walsh-Berger's theorem, which he proved in those two cases. In this this case also, in which the other representation is supercuspidal. Uh, yeah, so I uh, also mentioned that Walsh-Berger integral formula is available also in the work of Raphael Bujaplasi for unitary groups. A general integral formula for spherical variety has been formulated by Chen Wan in this work, which is to appear. I mean, it looks like a very, very impressive work to me that uh, somehow it's a bit mind boggling to uh, think about Walsh-Berger's conditions about how he creates uh, the tori on which the integrals are made. Okay. So an example, assume that either G is a split group and uh, sigma is induced from a character of the Borel or H is a split group and sigma prime is induced from a character on the Borel. Then the conjectured formula on Euler Poincare becomes EP sigma sigma prime is 1. Since in that case there are no elliptic elements in H except the trivial which is contained in a split torus inside the corresponding Borel subgroup. So somehow uh, uh, part of the deal of the character theory from induced representation is that the induced representation, the characters are non-zero only on the inducing subgroup. And if you want to evaluate the character eventually on elliptic element and you are inducing from a Borel subgroup, then uh, there is no intersection except at the trivial and uh, therefore, uh, the Walsh-Berger integral formula will give you 1 and therefore one will say that the Euler Poincare of such sigma sigma prime is 1. On the other hand, uh, this assertion on Euler Poincare is part of the earlier proposition. Okay. So, uh, I want to talk about a certain duality the theory which is part of uh, also the homological methods uh, for PRD groups. And uh, this I want to do to turn questions about uh, uh, x pi 1 pi 2 to questions about x pi 2 pi 1. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Usually one looks at representations of the smaller group appearing as a quotient, but one does not look at it as appearing as a submodule. But uh, this duality theorem will allow you to also look at HOM pi 2 pi 1. So, you know, one can ask uh, which representations appear as a submodule. Okay. So, Schneider is Tuller duality. So, let G be a reductive PRD group, uh, pi and irreducible admissible representation, uh, d pi be the split rank of the center of the levy from which uh, it arises, d pi be the uh, obvious Jelwinski involution of pi, then uh, x d pi pi d pi is isomorphic to C and uh, there is a perfect pairing uh, between uh, x pi pi prime and pi prime d pi. This is a perfect pairing for any smooth representation pi prime of g. Uh, okay, so with uh, various suggestions made along the way and using this uh, duality theorem, uh, here is the general picture. Uh, so, uh, as suggested earlier, we expect that when pi 1 and pi 2 are tempered, higher x are non-zero only for i equal to 0. On the other hand, by the duality theorem just discussed, we expect that x i is typically 0 for i equals 0, i e harm pi 2 pi 1 is 0 and shows up only for i equals the split rank of the center of the levy from which pi 2 arises through parabolic induction. This is not totally correct because, uh, uh, because of the problem that the obeyer jelwinski involution does not preserve the set of tempered representation. 
it can take tempered to non-tempered. So because of that problem, there is a small issue and I just want to illustrate that uh, with an example here. So here is an application of the duality theorem to, to existence of submodules. So it is a very concrete and simple minded problem to which abstract homological algebra is being put to use. Uh, so the following proposition gives a complete classification of irreducible submodules pi of the tensor product of two representations of GL2F with the product of their central characters trivial. So you know uh, this is the restriction problem from SO4, uh, GL2 cross GL2 to the diagonal GL2 and uh, one knows which uh, representations appear as a quotient. But now we want to ask which representations appear as a submodule. So, uh, okay, so here is the small proposition about it. Uh, let pi1, pi2 be two irreducible, admissible, infinite dimensional representations of GL2 with product of their central characters trivial. Then the following is a complete list of irreducible submodules of pi1 tensor pi2. So, of course, a supercuspidal representation appears. Whenever it appears as a quotient, it appears as a sub, no problems. And somehow the question is whether uh, there are others. And there is one more. If uh, pi is a twist of the Steinberg, which we assume by absorbing the twist in pi 1 or pi 2 to be the Steinberg representation of PGL to F, then the Steinberg is a submodule of pi 1 tensor pi 2, if and only if pi1, pi2 are both irreducible principal series and pi1 is the dual of pi2. So somehow uh, besides uh, this case, the only case when there is a submodule is Steinberg being a submodule of pi1 tensor pi2 dual, but uh, for PGL2 there is no concept of dual. So pi tensor pi where pi is an irreducible principal series. So the Steinberg is a submodule of pi tensor pi where pi is uh, pi is supposed to be a principal series okay uh, so you know in this slide i want to uh, uh, show you a template from algebraic geometry uh, uh, some basic theorems in algebraic geometry we seem to have closely related analogs in our context although for no obvious uh, reasons uh, for analogy, we consider H0 XF for XA smooth projective variety or sometimes more general variety equipped with the coherent sheaf F uh, versus home spaces and HI and X type. So there is the finite dimensity of HI and vanishing beyond the dimension. Then there are the semi-continuity theorems. Then there is the Riemann Rock theorem which expresses the Euler Poincare in terms of simple invariants which are built in one part by invariants associated to X and the invariant associated to the sheaf F. And in our integral formulae, uh, one going in Kazan orthogonality or in uh, walsh perger integral formula, we have a um, uh, set of elliptic tori and uh, uh, associated to the elliptic tori uh, and representations you have these uh, functions c sigma t. Then there is the Kodaira vanishing theorem for i positive, there is the say duality and then there is the special role played by the projective space and we have our own all her embracing majesty gl n. Somehow uh, uh, yeah. So I want to end my lecture summarizing some of the main suggestions in the lecture. Uh, vanishing of higher X groups for tempered representation or more generally for Vogan packets containing a generic representation. Then this one, knowledge obtained in studying home and X spaces can be fed into a more complete understanding of Bernstein decomposition. It is close to universal principal series when it is a projective module, which is typically the case. And one may anticipate where if we are in this typical case, 
using the non-tempered so I did not uh, 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 elaborate on that. Uh, then uh, I also uh, suggested that the Vosperger integral formula for tempered representation should be a theorem about Euler Poincare pairing for all representations. Then uh, I said that Euler Poincare pairing has a simple structure for GLN. I expect something almost as simple but have not figured it out for the classical groups. And this is something which I did not discuss in detail, notion of locally finitely generated and becoming projective modules on restriction should work out well in other situations such as the veil representation and its restriction to dual reductive pairs or for other context involving branching large. So yeah, so I have, uh, I cannot say I have uh, much interest in uh, uh, homological methods, but uh, questions about XI lead you on to understanding projective modules and projective resolutions and uh, it does appear to me that many modules which the restriction problem gives rise to are closely related to projective modules. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, any quick questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Dependra again and we will reconvene at 4.20.